it's my birthday once again. I would have liked to have a review ready, but do you have any idea how long it takes to censor Danganronpa spoilers? Whatever. Now that I'm old enough to take on casinos in both Canada and the US, I figured this might be a good time to look back on one of my favorite game series, Professor Layton. I'm not going to cover every game in depth, just my general thoughts on the series as a whole. Professor Layton was a puzzle game series that began on the Nintendo DS in 2007 and ended on the 3DS in 2013. Of course, if you lived in North America, the series would have lasted until 2014 when they finally localized Versus Ace Attorney. But we'll get to that. On my side of the story, the series was a gamble. Picture this. It's 2009. I'm in a game store and see a copy of Professor Layton and the Diabolical Box. Now, the me of 2009 didn't have a lot of money. My game collection was small, and I'm fairly certain the only other puzzle game I owned at the time was Tetris. But the game was used, on sale for $30. I decided to buy it. And then when I played it, I discovered it was the second game in the series. Dumbass. But looking back, I think this was a good place to start. And to explain why, let's take a look at the very first game in the series, Professor Layden and the Curious Village. The game begins with Professor Herschel Layden and his apprentice Luke Triton. They're headed to the town of St. Mystere. Yeah, I know. Obvious, right? Luke and Layton were summoned by Lady Dahlia, the widow of a wealthy baron, to find the mysterious golden apple mentioned in the baron's will. Of course, the first noticeable thing about the game is the fact that all of the cutscenes are fully animated. And they look really good. Reaching the next cutscene when playing through the game was always exciting. When they get to the town, they discover everyone in town loves puzzles. So much so that the townsfolk will almost always ask you to solve one if you tap them with the stylus. If you solve it, they might give you some vital information. All in all, it's a fun game. Yes, the puzzles are pretty forced and this continued throughout the series, but it's all for the sake of gameplay. I can understand that. The puzzles themselves are varied and can be frustrating at times, but you'll definitely feel accomplished when you solve one. Of course, there are hints, but they're basically pointless, usually either telling you to try harder or just flat out explaining how to solve the puzzle. This trend also continued throughout the entire series. The problem is, with this being the first game, there are a lot of issues that weren't fully worked out. It starts with the name entry screen. Instead of the usual keyboard that other DS games use, the game wants you to write out your name letter by letter. And the game is horrendous at recognizing letters. Good luck writing a proper A, and the difference between an uppercase D and an O? Just forget it. Luckily, the second game ironed out these issues and made it much easier to use. One thing I'm really glad they fixed is the exclamation points. Let me explain. In the first game, anytime you tapped on someone to talk to them, an exclamation point pops up. Kind of overkill, right? Well, in the second game, the exclamation point only shows up when you tap someone who has a puzzle for you to solve. Much better. This is why I'm glad I started with Diabolical Box. I'm not entirely sure the first game would have really grabbed me with all of its issues. And as we're talking about the second game, it's kind of impossible to avoid spoilers for the first game where most of the series' important characters are introduced. It's also necessary to know that the series was split up into two trilogies, and they have some different characters. The recurring villain for the first trilogy was Don Paolo. Don Paolo was the shittiest villain I've ever seen. The closest he ever came to actually harming Leighton was in the first game. After that, he'd show up for a surprise twist in the story and then be pretty much useless. And when you finally find out his reason for becoming Layden's enemy halfway through the third game, his character feels like even more of a waste of time, especially compared to Layden's tragic backstory that's revealed in the very same game. And Flora, for fuck's sake, don't even get me started on her. She's useless. Absolutely useless constantly getting kidnapped or lost, always whining about how she doesn't want to be alone, and pestering Leighton and Luke to bring her annoying ass along on adventures. She's just the worst. Because, in all honesty, these games didn't need a token girl character, especially if she was just going to be a damsel in distress. Leighton and Luke stand well on their own, 
I mean, okay, Luke is annoying with his, oh, I'm Professor Layton's apprentice nonsense, but he can talk to animals, don't ask, so he's at least useful. And Professor Layton is a great character. He's an English gentleman, a professor of archaeology, a puzzle-solving master, and he's surprisingly good at sword fighting. Plus, don't we all wish we could get away with wearing such a ludicrously tall top hat? But that was just the first trilogy. Now, not to give too much away, but the third game ended with Luke leaving Professor Layton because his father's job got transferred. After the credits roll, we get an extra cutscene where Layton gets a letter from Luke explaining that he's come across some sort of mystery. And then the game finishes with a to be continued. This is where things changed. First, no, it's not continued. We are never going to know what the fuck Luke was talking about in his letter because the second trilogy was a prequel. God damn it, why? Second, this is where a lot of plot holes began. That's not to say that the stories took place in a firm, grounded reality before the prequels. The stories have always been ridiculous. I think I've only figured out what the twist was before it was explained once, mostly because the twists usually involve shit that is literally impossible even though the game seems to take place in the real world. Anyway, back to the prequel issue. I understand the idea. They wanted to show how Leighton and Luke met, fair enough. But it feels like there was a conscious effort to make the prequels not fit with the original trilogy at all. The prequel trilogy, starting with Professor Leighton and The Last Spectre, introduced new characters, like Professor Leighton's assistant, Emiel Tava. Still an unnecessary character, especially after you see how they explain why she isn't in the original trilogy, but I liked her. She was basically the anti-Flora. She knew how to kick ass and didn't take shit from anybody. She and Leighton visit the village of Miss Tallery after Leighton receives a letter from an old friend of his requesting help. A giant specter is attacking the town at night, and I guess this is just the sort of thing for Leighton to handle. When they get to Miss Tallery, they discover Leighton's friend is the mayor and he has a son, Luke Triton. Okay, pause. This is not a bad way for them to meet. It fits in well with the story. However, I do take issue with how much of an emo little shit Luke is in this game. Regular Luke is kind of annoying. This Luke that looks out of windows dramatically and pretends to be super mysterious is incredibly annoying. Like, damn kid, I know things are bad, your mom's missing, a specter's wrecking shit in your town, but lighten the fuck up. So, this part happens to be spoilers, but screw it. The recurring villain of this trilogy is Descale. We don't even need to compare him to Don Paolo because you can see the improvement just by looking at him. He's got a diabolical plan, and he usually goes up against Leighton just because he's in his way. He's a badass in addition to being an intellectual match for Leighton. He's a great villain, at least until the sixth game. Anyway, this trilogy started on the DS and continued on the 3DS with the game Professor Layton and the Miracle Mask. And the leap to 3D wasn't exactly kind to this series. The characters don't look good in 3D at all. They look all blocky and weird. Yes, making the games 3D allowed for new types of puzzles, but really... Everyone looks terrible. And while I do appreciate these games going into more detail about Layton's history, they really seem to harm the story more than help it. Even if you ignore the fact that none of these things are mentioned in the original trilogy, they made for some pretty cheap, nonsensical reveals. I'm not lying when I say that the last couple hours of Professor Layton and the Azran Legacy felt like a freaking soap opera. I honestly didn't enjoy the 3DS games as much. I've played through all of the DS Professor Layton games at least twice, some of them more, but I've never replayed any of the 3DS games. And they're not bad games, but for some reason, I just couldn't get into them the way I got into the DS games. But in the middle of all these games was the release of the Professor Layton movie. It was alright. Nothing spectacular, but hey, it didn't suck. That's about all you can ask of a movie based on a video game. Also, the film is in canon with the games. Somehow. This should be where I end things, but this series had one last trick up its sleeve before the hellhole known as Layton 7. Professor Layton versus Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. This game was genius. I mean, the idea of it was genius. 
brilliant, actually. Let's be real, both game series were pretty much based around solving a mystery. Professor Layton solved mysteries through puzzles, Phoenix Wright solved mysteries through the justice system. Plus, they both perfected dramatic pointing. Combining the puzzles from Professor Layton with the trials from Ace Attorney actually worked rather well, and I'm glad that even though the game takes place between Diabolical Box and Unwon Future, they left Flora out of the game. Although, I must admit, having the game take place in a medieval setting was a strange choice. Also, as I mentioned before, this was the last Professor Layton game to be released in North America, even though it came out before the final game in the series in Japan. No idea why. So, even though it has its problems and I can bitch about the prequels for hours, the Professor Layton series was fantastic. It was ridiculous at times, but the puzzles were challenging and fun and the characters were memorable. It definitely deserves to be one of my favorites. Honestly, I don't know how Layton 7 is going to turn out. I mean, it'll probably suck, because who the hell releases a game on the 3DS and smartphone simultaneously? But on the other hand, it's probably been cancelled because it's been a year since any news on the game has been released. Oh, and I know I didn't mention what I thought of Layton Brothers Mystery Room. That's because it's not a Professor Layton game. Layton needs a paternity test too, because that's not his kid either. <sighs> Believe it or not, I'm done talking. You all should already know what the next review will be, so if you want to see that, subscribe, and the next review will be posted soon. I promise. And thanks for listening to my memories. We'll see you next time.